Heidi, hey, how are you doing? We'll leave that because <laughs> that's quite funny. Um, today, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the equipment um, that I'm currently using to film all the videos. I watch a lot of people on YouTube, people that make sort of adventure travel stuff. Um, and I'm curious, I'm like, well, how do, they, how do they film that so well? How do they make that sound so good? And I'm not saying that my stuff sounds or looks particularly great, but I do think I've learned a few things over the few years I've been doing this. And I wanted to share that with you guys. And I wanted to show you what I'm currently using because I think I just think it's quite interesting. I like talking about equipment and how I've modified certain things to make it suit my needs. So without further ado, we're going to get started. So the first thing I want to talk about is the GoPros that we use. We use two. We use this Hero 7, which is kitted out in quite a weird way. I'll talk about that. Um, and we use this Hero Session 5, Hero 5 Session. Small little, small little guy. And that has a specific use, which I'll get to as well. But first, let's talk about this one. Um, honestly, I didn't think the GoPros uh, would be using them as much as we, we have done, or especially this one. This one has been incredibly useful on the bike uh, in terms of just having a camera that you can pull out and start filming instantly. I think that's where the real strength of the GoPros and any kind of action camera comes in. It doesn't look or sound as good as the rig that you're, you're viewing right now, um, but its real strength is just the fact that you can pull it out of a bag and start filming without really thinking about it. It's just speed. This particular Hero 7, I've kitted out in quite an interesting way. Um, it has, let's, let's, let's break them apart a little bit. So it's the main camera. And then attached to that is the audio adapter, which allows you to plug in just any old microphone, 3.5 millimeter input. Um, and then that's held onto this whole rig with this little plastic piece. It just connects onto the standard GoPro cage. That just sort of slips on. Um, the USB-C plugs into the GoPro, and then you can plug whatever mic you want into this input. Um, I've chosen this little ceremonic microphone. This isn't what it looks like out of the box. I've come and modified this quite a lot because I thought it looked quite flimsy when it came out of the box. Um, so I've added this kind of bungee system which connects onto the cold shield on top of this cage. And that way it just holds it in place and it just gives me peace of mind that we can kind of throw it around into bags or whatever. And this microphone isn't going to get broken off or pulled out. Um, on top of the mic, I've attached dead cat stuff just fluff basically. And that means that, yeah, if you are in windy places, which we are a lot of the time when filming this stuff, uh, you're more likely to get usable audio out of this thing than you would be if you were to use the inbuilt mics on these GoPros. Because all GoPros, if you're in a windy environment, they sound pretty crap. All right, so I thought you might want to hear what this whole rig sounds like. So this is the GoPro with the ceremonic mic attached. And while you have a little listen, I'm going to tell you about this video sponsor. Surfshark is a VPN app and browser extension which allows you to change your IP address and also unblock websites and content that you otherwise wouldn't be able to access. It also adds an extra layer of security to help keep your passwords and personal data safe. Now, I don't know what you do on the internet, and frankly, I don't think I want to know, but if you want to keep this stuff private, using a VPN is, is quite a good way of doing this. Without it, your ISP and other third parties can see what you're browsing, but if you use a VPN, you can hide your identity, you can hide your IP address, and you can just keep yourself safe while you're browsing the internet. Surfshark also allows you access to the USA version of Netflix, which is the largest library of Netflix. Um, so if you've run out of movies and TV shows to watch, then you can sign into a, a USA-based IP address and watch shows that you may not have access to in your own country. So if you think the Surfshark VPN might be for you, uh, then now is a brilliant time to sign up because you can make the most of their Black Friday deal, which gives you 83% uh, off and four months free which works out to just $2.13 a month if you sign up with my link, Ed Pratt, below. You'll find the link in the description. It supports the channel. Now, back to the video. So that's, that's basically the setup with this one. Um, the downside of this is that it does make it uh, not totally waterproof anymore. I haven't had any, any issues with it. We've been using it in quite heavy downpours, and it's been fine, but it does mean you have to be a little bit more careful with it. Uh, but I'm happy to risk it in these kind of environments to get certain shots. Oh, yeah, and, and this, this is the... I don't know what the, the actual make is, but it's an Ulanzi selfie stick. It doesn't come out super far, but it comes out a little bit. So if you want to do a kind of vloggy style setup, you can just like that, nice and easy. Uh, and it also has these three feet, so you can pop it down and get a nice ride by shot or whatever you might desire. So that's, yeah, that's our little GoPro rig. And then we also pull it, I, yeah, I'll also pull off the mic 
throw the camera onto a selfie stick, which I have mounted on the tandem, um, throw it into a super view mode on, on the camera, which sort of captures the widest field of view it can. And then that way we have this kind of bike cam, uh, which looks pretty good. And I've got a kind of audio setup, which all plugs into that, which I have outlined in the first video of the Southwest Coast series. So if you're curious about that, you can go check that out. Anyway, that's the GoPro Hero 7. I put him back here because he looks nice just in the corner. Yeah, there we go, there he goes. And this is the GoPro Hero 5 session. And this one, I'll, I'll show you actually. Very, sorry, very specific use case for this one. This is my little chest cam rig. So I'll come down here. And this one I use in conjunction with the, um, the Hero 7 on the bike. So we have the Hero 7 pointing back at us on the bike, capturing the kind of that perspective and also um, decent audio through the, the lav mic setup that we have going on. And then this one, we bung that onto our chest and then you can kind of see the handlebars. I'll put footage here so you can see what I'm talking about, but I've been playing around with this one recently and it, it looks pretty cool. What I would say, this one I shoot without the inbuilt stabilization. What I do is I shoot it in a four by three aspect ratio um, without stabilization and then run it through on the computer, a program called Real Steady Go, uh, which takes like the gyro data of the camera and just gives it some incredible stabilization, much better than what this camera can produce. And that way you kind of get the best results out of this older, slightly older camera. And that's that's basically what what we use the Hero 5 for. Okay, moving on, I'll, say, I'll take this off. Moving on to what is filming this video right now. This is the main camera. Uh, you know what I'll do, I'll, I'll switch to the GoPro and then I'll be able to hold the camera and show you what I'm talking about. All right, I've switched to the GoPro now because I wanna show off the main camera that we've been using for these videos and that is the Panasonic Lumix G9. Um, honestly, excellent camera. I, I'm glad I, I changed systems. I used to use uh, Sony's, which also you know, were, were pretty good for, for what I was doing. Um, like it was the A6300 that I, I was using in the A6000s. Um, but I was finding with those cameras, the stabilization was lacking a little bit and I was producing shakier footage than I, than I wanted really. Um, which is where this camera kind of fixes those problems. The stabilization inside this camera is incredible. Um, and it's the main reason why I got it, because the sensor is smaller inside this camera. Uh, in low light, it's, yeah, it's not as good as the Sony's, but I'm happy to take that trade off for the fact that the stabilization is so damn good that you can just kind of hold it out. And I'm not saying don't worry about kind of holding the camera still or kind of minimizing shake, but it just means that it just makes a much, a much nicer viewing experience for, for you guys uh, watching my stuff if, if the footage isn't shaky. Um, and I'm finding that's much easier to achieve with this camera than with other cameras I've used in the past. So that's, that's the main reason I upgraded to this system. Oh yeah, and another, another thing, nice flippy screen as well on, on this camera. Just having that is incredibly useful because previously I've been like, having to try and do everything without really being able to see uh, the framing. Um, so that's, that's, yeah, that's another reason why I got this camera. And then on top of it, we've got the Rode Video Micro, which to be honest, it's just a solid little microphone. We've got to, yeah, we've got to try and navigate our way around this lake because it's not obvious where the road is. The road turned into a track and we're basically riding on grass. You can't really go wrong. And it, I, for me, it, it's, it sounds better than enough. Better than enough, good English head. With this Panasonic, I've got three lenses and I don't necessarily want you to focus so much on the exact lenses that I'm using, but more uh, the kind of focal ranges um, because basically I had the same kind of focal ranges with the other, the other Sony system I was using. And I, th I think you only need three lenses really to be able to kind of film the stuff that I want to film. The sort of wide angle lens that I use for this, for this camera is the 8 to 18. So it's a Leica, something or other. Anyway, it's it's pretty good. Like it's, more, it was more expensive than the camera. I think the camera cost me 600 quid secondhand, whereas the lens was closer to 700 quid um, secondhand. So it, it's an expensive lens. It's a decent piece of glass on the front of this thing. And it's quite heavy still, but 
it's kind of the only thing out there if you want a wide angle lens which auto focuses on this Panasonic system. So it was something I knew before I got the, the camera. I just knew that, yeah, this was the lens that I was gonna pair with it. And it's pretty good, like it's super wide. So for kind of vloggy style stuff, it's great. And then it also has a little bit of reach. So if you wanna, you wanna zoom it in, you can reach a little bit further than you would if it was just a fixed lens. Um, the other two lenses that I use, this is, what is it? It's a 45 to 200 millimeter lens. And this one has a serious amount of reach because of how Micro Four Thirds work. For a lens this size, you get an equivalent, it's, okay, it's 200 millimeters, but with the Micro Four Thirds sensor, you get an equivalent of a 400 millimeter lens. And the reason I use this lens so much is because it makes mountains look massive. And it's counterintuitive because you think, ah, you know, you're in a big mountainous environment, you want, you want to make stuff look impressive. Let's put the, like the widest lens on that we possibly can. Well, actually, by doing that, you're zooming out and you're making stuff look tiny. Whereas if you've got a big mountain in the distance uh, and then you can somehow put yourself in the foreground, I'll try and give examples here because I'm sure I've got footage to show it off. Having a, a lens like this that can reach all the way to 200 millimeters, say 400 millimeters equivalent, um, it's just incredibly useful. And, and also um, wildlife as well. I don't shoot a lot of wildlife stuff, but occasionally you see like a bird in the sky or you, you see something that you want to get some video of. Uh, being able to have that reach is very useful for that as well, to be able to get that kind of environmental stuff, to be able to cut in so it's not all just cycling stuff. You can kind of show the environment and that's, that's, that's why this lens is very, very useful. And the third lens that we lug around is this little 25 millimeter uh, f1.7. And the main reason for this one is so that you know, we can at least attempt to do some stuff in low light. It has a 1.7 aperture, so it means that when the sun has gone down or at least is going down or, you know, we've done stuff by the campfire and things before, and you can whack this lens on the camera and you can get some usable shots. Um, it's also nice to have a lens where you can get a bit of depth of field. Um, you can with this longer telephoto one, but with the, uh, the wide angle, you can't really get much kind of separation from the background much sort of background blur. So having a lens which allows you to do that, like this 1.7, is great. Um, so that's it, that's it for the lenses. Um, on all these lenses, I've got um, these step-up rings, which means that I can use the same filter on, each, on all, all three of them. And the only filter that I wanna use is this ND filter. This is the uh, Peter McKinnon Polar Pro Variable ND. It's two stops to five stops, so it means that it cuts two stops up to five stops worth of light and you can kind of twist it and change the amount of intensity that it has. And the reason you'd want to put a neutral density filter on the front of your lenses um, is to create natural motion blur. Um, so I, yeah, I'm, I'm not gonna go too much in depth into this, but basically by cutting the amount of light that's hitting your sensor, you can control your shutter speed. And by controlling your shutter speed, you can create this kind of natural motion blur, uh, which looks correct. It looks more like what the human eye sees and I prefer that look. So that's the reason I put an ND filter on the front of all my lenses when I'm shooting outside. Obviously when it's dark, like in this environment, I'm not using it at the moment, but outside on a bright sunny day or even on a cloudy day, I'll be using this thing uh, to be able to control my shutter speed and make sure that it's 1 50th all the time. Okay, moving on. What should we go on next? What should we go to next? Uh, I know you've got a nice drone here, which I will talk about, but maybe we will talk about something else first. Maybe we'll talk about audio. Ooh, so I've already talked about the Rode uh, Video Micro on top of the main camera, but you're probably not listening to that. I suspect that in the edit, I will choose that this audio is better. So this is, this has been recording this whole time. This is the uh, Zoom H1N. Anyway, it's a small little handy recorder. It record, it doesn't, there's no kind of wireless stuff. It's not sending this to the camera. I'm gonna to need to sync this audio up to the camera at a later date in editing. Uh, but this records onto a little micro SD card. And into this, I've plugged a little lavalier mic, which is running under my shirt and is here. Um, and the reason you'd wanna do that for stuff like this, it's not practical all the time. But the reason you want to do that is so that you can just get 
your microphone as close to your audio source, which in this case is my mouth, as possible. Anyway, audio is very underrated. So if you're looking to make this, these kind of styles of videos, I suggest you look to actually invest in some audio equipment. I don't use this one all the time, but I do use these lav mics quite a lot. And obviously I use the, the mic on top of the, the GoPro and the mic on top of the Panasonic camera a lot as well. Just, just working out a system that works in the environments that you're gonna be in. in. In my case, it's a lot of sort of windy outdoor environments is important. So I would look to get some good audio equipment and I feel like the stuff I have works pretty well. The next thing I wanna talk about is the tripod that I use actually. Um, it's kind of an underrated bit of equipment, but it is important and it is definitely a consideration when you're touring on a bike or on a unicycle even. I carry this, this tripod on the unicycle because of the weight. You, do, you, you, know, you don't want to be carrying this massively heavy brick of a tripod everywhere. So I, I think I found this happy medium with this one. It's a, it's a slick mini two, I think is what it's called. Uh, it comes up to, I don't know, if I stand up, it probably comes up to about there. So it's not, it's not head height. And I think in the future, I would like to find one that is head height because it is a little bit limiting sometimes having a camera which you can't quite get tall enough. But as a compromise for the weight, um, it's a pretty solid little tripod and it's obviously durable because it's survived a couple of years on a unicycle and a few years after that doing various other trips. I've always taken on stuff. So it's certainly something that's sort of overlooked when you're looking at camera gear, but having, uh, especially when you're doing kind of stuff that I'm doing a lot of, sort of self-filming, I, I couldn't do what I was doing without a tripod. And this one's been, yeah, quite good. Anyway, let's talk about drones. Let's talk about drones. So the first drone that I ever owned was a, I've only owned two actually. <laughs> but the first drone was a DJI Spark. It was a lovely little compact little drone. I bought it at the start of uh, the USA uh, crossing. So when I arrived in, in the States in California on my unicycle, I was like, I was gonna cross to, to New York. So I thought, okay, I'll get, I'll get a drone, why not? Um, so I went onto Craigslist and I found this little DJI Spark for, I think I bought it for $400 with like extra batteries and, and gubbins and whatever. And it was, it was a very capable drone. It, it did very well. It, you know, the footage looked good. Um, and it was really cool to have for the first time sort of aerial stuff of my videos. And I managed to work out how to ride along with the unicycle and also film at the same time and really show, it really gave context to where I was. And it, yeah, you could really establish where you were with that kind of aerial footage. And we used that, yeah, that little DJI Spark when we were doing our ride around the Southwest coast. But it was a little bit limiting. The footage it produces is only 1080p, 30 frames a second, which meant that I always had to, it was always a pain when putting that 30 frames a second into a 25 frame timeline, which is what I, I shoot in. But mainly it was the 1080p. Uh, I've been choosing it now everything in 4K and you could really see uh, the difference in quality. But that wasn't the main issue actually. The main issue we were having with that drone is that we wanted to get some nice shots of us riding. We wanted, yeah, we want some aerial shots from shot from the air of us cycling as well and us in the shot. And we were finding that the connection between the controller and the drone just wasn't quite strong enough with the Spark. After the drone got 100, 200 meters away, it would, the signal would start to degrade and sometimes it would cut out completely. So I decided, you know what, I'll, I'll upgrade. So I sold that drone and bought a little DJI Mini 2, which honestly has been great. Um, and you haven't really seen any footage from this drone on the channel yet because we've been using it while we've been riding across Georgia, which is where I am now. Um, but it's pretty much fixed all the issues I had with the, uh, with the Spark. So first of all, this thing shoots in 4K, which is great because I shoot 4K with the GoPro, shoot 4K with the Panasonic. It's nice to have the drone that's, you know, fits that resolution so that everything is now in 4K. Footage looks incredible out of this thing, but mainly it's the connection. It uses a different way of connecting to the controller. And this thing, you can fly it, you know, kilometers away and it still keeps a really rock steady connection, um, which is great. The other benefit of this drone over the Spark is that the batteries last like, I've got like half an hour out of one of these, maybe a little bit less, but with the Spark, they used to last like 10, 15 minutes. Whereas this, you're getting about 25 minutes 
um, with one battery, which is incredibly handy, especially if you're going for days and days without anywhere to be able to charge. And yeah, just the footage out of this thing is it's nice. It's very nice. I would say I don't like the kind of digital sharpening that they do to their footage. And it's a shame that you can't kind of tone down the kind of artificial sharpening that they add on the footage after the fact. You can't really change any of that, but it's a small price to pay and the footage still looks great. On the front of this boy, um, I've got a little ND filter. It's a little ND16 from Freewell. Um, and I think for the majority of cases, an ND16 is actually all you need. You can, you can buy packs of ND filters for, for these kind of drones. Um, and you can get like an ND8 and an ND16 and an ND32 and an ND64. Honestly, I think a 16 is all you need, really. On a bright, on a super, super bright sunny day, it's maybe not quite enough. But for the majority of cases, I can achieve a uh, 50th of a second out of this camera. And if it gets, yeah, obviously when, when, when the sun starts to go down, it starts getting a bit more low light, I pop it off. Um, but on a normally sunny-ish kind of day, I find that that works well and I can, I can control the camera how I want to control it. Um, and it's been great for getting nice kind of ride, ride by shots. We've been getting some fun stuff with this thing, which I look forward to sharing with you in the Georgian series. And what's really cool with this drone is that it packs down to, you know, next to nothing really. Like the drone is just tiny. Like that's even smaller than the Spark, even though the Spark was a, and the Spark was a bigger drone actually. Yeah, um, anyway. <laughs> What am I saying? It's just it's just a small it's a small little thing to take with you, um, and it's produced some really cool video. I'm very pleased with this with this purchase. It's very very good. Um, the controller's huge. It's it's kind of mad that the controller is like double the size of the drone. Uh, but anyway, the whole package, all in is yeah, it's fine. Like for the for, for the aerial shots that you can get, it's a small price to pay for something like this. And so far, fingers crossed, we haven't crashed it, which is good. Um, oh, the other cool feature about this drone is that you can plug in the batteries into this little kind of charging dock. So you can plug it in, they all kind of charge, you know, one after the other, one after the other. Um, but what's also cool is you can charge the other way. So you can only deplete these batteries until about, you know, 20%, 10% before the drone starts kind of shouting at you to bring it back. And at that point, you're left with a battery which has you know, still a little bit of power left in it, but there's nothing you can really do with it because you can't take the drone up again and fly with it. Um, so you're just left with a little bit of power. So for the kind of stuff that we're doing where we're away from the, we're off grid for, you know, a week or so, more than that, um, it's useful to be able to then, you can then plug a USB A into it and you can then use this to then charge your phone, which is, yeah, it's quite handy really. It's, it's a nice feature to have, it's useful. Okie dokie, um, I think, I think that's basically it for everything I want to talk about. That's that's all the filming gear I use. If you want me to make a video about how I edit stuff and the kind of equipment I use for that and software and all that kind of jazz, then then I'll be certainly up for making a video about that. Um, but I hope you've got some value out of this. I'm obviously not saying go out and buy all this equipment. Obviously, I because I have it and I've used it for a while, I do recommend it. But equally, I've told you some of the flaws with some of this stuff. Um, it's, yeah, obviously none of this stuff is required. Like you could go out and you could make, you could tell compelling, uh, stories and, and make interesting videos with a phone if you, if you needed to. Um, but it is nice to have dedicated equipment to be able to get aerial stuff, to be able to shoot, you know, stuff that you know is going to have decent audio, decent picture, uh, reliable equipment that's durable. Um, it's, it's all beneficial to be able to go out and kind of do this stuff. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed watching me talk about what I use. Um, thank you for watching and I'll see you next time for whatever video I decide to make because I'm not totally sure yet. Uh, there are some, yeah, there's more touring stuff to come. Um, but in the meantime, I just thought I'd quickly make this one and show you what, what I'm using because I think it's quite interesting. Okay. Thank you very much and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Oh, and, and one last thing. Um, buy a t-shirt if, if, if you like the design. I like the design. I saw the designs it and it's, it's lovely and it supports what we do. So we would appreciate it very much. 
Um, that's it. Anyway, plug over. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> I, I shoulders a little bit freaked out by the balcony here. We're <laughs> You're all right. You're don't fine. Don't we're we're 18 me. floors up. I just want to do the the end okay. end part of the okay. video with you. Uh, thank you for watching, and thank you very much to everyone who's supporting on Patreon. Um, I am obviously biased, and I want to thank you more than everyone else. I'm like a a father that has favourite children. So thank you very much, Alistair Duran, Almas Kingis, Anthony McGrogan, Brad Allen Armstrong, Brett St Pierre. Buzz Covington, Christopher Janssons, Cosmic Disaster, Craig Piper, Damon Walker, Elijah Lachanda, Gerda Navaya, Gary Hull, Jason and Gina, Jerry Borchard, Jordan Pilling, Jason and Rebecca Chivers, Mark Paris, Michael and Jen Wolfendale, Neil Brooks, Philip Merritt, Seymour Butt, Sharon Chung, Stephen Jones, Warren Snyder, and Wolfie. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next time. <laughs> yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>